Uh, I'll be presenting on rehabbing a hamstring strain in a team setting. And yeah, just like you just uh, told my story a little bit, um, <clears throat> culminated with that injury, he's in Dynamo, and then just eventually led into uh, wanting to be a strength conditioning coach. And that's kind of my mission is to kind of be the strength and conditioning coach that I kind of wish I always had, because that was kind of my biggest downfall as a player was the fitness side. So uh, it's like, kind of ironic that now that's kind of my strength now. So it's kind of funny, kind of funny story to tell a lot of times to my, my former teammates and friends that know me. Um, a little bit about my philosophy, just real quickly. Um, it's really rooted in these four stacks at the bottom. Uh, the two most important ones to me really are the human relationships and the history of the sport. You know, for me, I grew up and, uh, and I was raised in soccer. Uh, my mom always says I really had no choice. Uh, you know, growing up being Mexican-American in Southern California, soccer is part of the culture. Um, everybody in my family played it um, and I loved it. Um, I kind of always uh, reference back to the movie, The Dark Knight Rises, where Bane and Batman are having that fight and the, 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 the lights go out. And Bane tells Batman that he not, he merely adopted the darkness, whereas Bane was born into it. Um, that's kind of I re, I, uh, I relate a lot to that, where I was born into it. So uh, for me, it's it's really the the environment I grew up in that I'm so comfortable in that I know the most about. Um, so when I got done playing, I what I wanted to do is continue to stay involved in the sport because it's what I knew the most about and what I enjoyed the most, and felt that that's kind of that's really what I wanted to do for. For the rest of my uh, my job for my for my life in terms of uh, the work side, um, and then after that, um, it really really it kind of coincides with just the human relationships aspect. Um, I really like this quote from Tony Strudwick where he says that the best coaches in the future will be the ones who combine the science with the art of engaging with the athlete. Um, and for me, I take a lot of pride in that. I think that's really my my biggest strength as a as a coach is just my ability to connect with players in that soccer environment because uh, a lot of times. Um, I like I like telling stories to players about uh, either my career or the his or moments in the history of the sport that kind of really good paint a good picture for for the athlete to kind of understand the, the situation that we're trying to get through in that moment in time. Um, and I'm a huge history buff too, so I I love uh, studying the sport from uh, the history, like World Cups, who's played for what teams, coaches, and you know all that stuff. Uh, kind of trying to be an encyclopedia, really. Um, and now from a performance side, kind of studying the last 10 years and, and 15 years of, of you know, what has worked in team sport from the soccer side. Um, and then just the other side is uh, other, stuff, other stuff on top of that with the isolation, integration, improvisation. That stuff is pretty self-explanatory that I don't think uh, many people would argue right now at this point. But just wanted to mention that a little bit. And just a little bit about the club a little bit, just so you guys understand some context. The, the way I kind of want to uh, present this case study to you guys is is uh, is through a story, kind of imagine yourselves coming to visit me throughout this whole rehab process and what you would see every single day and what I do every single day. So before that, you kind of have to know a little bit about what the club's like. And like, it's, like you said, Aiden, I'm the second team coach. So we sit right in the middle of the, uh, in between the first team and the academy team. And my team is made up mainly of a combination of three buckets, which is uh, academy kids that move up and play with us, the players that are signed to the G2 second team, and the first team players that come down and play with us at the weekend. And these are the questions that, questions that we're going to answer uh, throughout this re uh, rehab case study. Um, what was the injury? Uh, what was the rehab outline in the program? Uh, what was the outcome? And what can the audience take away from this presentation? So what happened? Uh, so this player, he's a forward for us. He, we play a 4-3-3, and he plays out on the right as a 7 and as a 9. Um, on Saturday, we had a game. He played full 90 minutes. Sunday, he had a day off. On Monday, he had a recovery day. Tuesday, uh, right, uh, trained with the team. And then on Wednesday, unfortunately, he pulls his hamstring right in the warm-up. Uh, on Wednesdays, I always like to have the team do uh, a couple of max velocity sprints just so that they're hitting their max velocity uh, every other, every couple of days just to kind of serve as like a hamstring prevention. Uh, and unfortunately, he pulled it in the right before we were about to do those um, doing some acceleration drills. Um, it, it, it sucks, it's good, but it's real. Um, after that, uh, our ATC, our physio, um, uh, did, his man, did, did a manual muscle test and decided and uh, came to the conclusion that it was a right hamstring strain, right in his bicep femoris muscle. Um, and we graded it as a 0.5 uh, to one uh, muscle strain. 
and estimated that it would take him about 14 days to come back from this. Uh, after that, we went back into the office and we looked at our calendar and just right away got to work in terms of uh, mapping out the, the road for him. Um, and so what you see here is just these three color supported three color uh, stages that we're going to kind of work in. Uh, we quickly realized he wasn't going to be available for that 14th game in September and the 20th, but we thought, okay, it's 14 days. Let's get, we can easily get him back for the 28th if, if everything goes according to the plan. Um, the way we uh, do our return to play with Galaxy 2 is, and the way I kind of tell my players is, hey, look, this is like a video game. Um, each In a video game, the levels get uh, start off really easy and they get harder as they go. So um, every stage uh, at the beginning will be really easy. So we're going to really work on the basics in terms of uh, all aspects of movement, really just trying to teach uh, the basics and just trying to create a, a good foundation so that later on uh, he'll be able to handle uh, the more difficult exercises and drills that we're gonna that we're gonna be doing. So I just tell them like, look, it gets easier. And, I mean, it gets harder as it goes. And by the end, if you pass the last, the last level of the game, uh, you're you're you pass the, you pass return to play, and you're available to train, and 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 you'll be ready for whatever uh, game we have coming up. So the first stage right there in red was just pretty much getting him ready for stage two, uh, all the way to five. And that's really the work that he's going to do on the field with me. And then the green down at the bottom from the 22nd all the way to the 27th are, is kind of uh, that transition zone from uh, on-field rehab and gym work with me to the actual uh, pitch where he's going to be training with the team. Uh, this is the uh, GPS cumulative load tracker that we're going to look at throughout this presentation. Um, the goal really is to accumulate the amount of work that he would do in a week's worth of training and rehab with me. So. Uh, typically, uh, in a four-day buildup to a game, uh, we usually hit about 20 to 25,000 meters of distance running, uh, 1,000 to 1,500 meters of high-speed running within 19 to 25 kilometer zone, and then about 200 to 350 meters of sprinting, and then explosive efforts, 100, 150, and then, like I said, I try to get all my guys to hit uh, their 100% of their max velocity throughout the week just to kind of uh, prevent a hamstring strain. Uh, the test and exit criteria that we're going to look at, again, uh, number one, like you just saw, all the GPS metrics. Um, the second is a, we utilize the Nordboard, and we just have them do a very basic Nordic curl just to see if they can hit what they were hitting before the injury. Um, number three, the running drills, which you'll see in stages two through seven. Um, and then number four is kind of that last real test it's actually the scariest one because you're really getting him to to sprint at his uh at his 100 max ability so it's usually it's just a fly zone sprint um and then the last one are all the position drills that he will that he does with me or that he did with me in this case um and i just usually just use my eye test it, for me it's just watching him and just seeing does he look good um is, is he doing everything the way he was doing everything before the injury so um, it's nothing Nothing too crazy, but um, very simple for, for, for our environment. And so right after that, right, we, right when we had the plan, I just wanted to uh, quickly show this player itinerary because it, for, I think it's important to understand that with Galaxy 2, we only have one physio and one fitness coach. So we have to be really organized when it comes to managing our time and kind of how we, uh, how we transition from, from one part of the day to the next day. So uh, player arrives 30 minutes before the healthy players. Um, after that, he has to go and do all his uh, all his own uh, work that the physio gives him. Um, out, once he's done with that, we'll go outside. And what happens is that the uh, the physio will warm up the injured player, uh, and while I warm up the team. And then, as soon as the team is done warming up, they'll go to the coach, and then I'll take over from the physio and take the injured player. And then we'll begin doing all of our rehab right on the field. Um, and then I usually will try to end the rehab about you know, 15 minutes before the practice is over so that we can go into the gym and wrap up uh, whatever gym work we have for that day. And the only reason I do that is because sometimes we have gym uh, after practice. So I think it, uh, I try to uh, end the gym in with the rehab injured player so that when the players come back in from training, um, I'm already done doing the guy's rehab and I can jump right into the team list. Uh, so that's just uh, a little bit of that information from uh, the player itinerary side. So stage one is really uh, just getting him uh, ready to run. Um, this area, uh, I think uh, 
I, what's really important to, to, to know is that I was really trying to kind of work around the injury um, and not really touch the hamstring. So uh, I really felt that at this point, let's, let's see what we can get out of him. So uh, really early on, I wanted to work on, uh, on that glute and the hip and the core. So um, really wanted to uh, involve a lot of isometric work with him just to kind of get him to own the position and get some time under tension. Um, I think isometrics are really important and they're really good for this part of the rehab because they're pretty safe um, and they also build a lot of good stability. Um, so we did a lot of that really early on uh, for the first three days. That's what we did. So uh, that first day it was really easy. Uh, all he did was just kind of pain and swelling with the, the physio, but right away day two, um, had him in the gym doing clamshells, dead bugs, loop bridge, iso holes, and then just some upper body with the bench press, some payoff presses, some body body saw with TRX. And then on the third day, a little bit more volume, but again, just really uh, emphasizing those isometricals that uh, that I think will be really important for him to to, uh, to do for the, the running portion that you'll see next. Um, stage two, uh, pretty much is uh, run without pain. Um, at this, uh, the, the, what I, I highlighted here in red is really what I'm gonna be emphasizing. Uh, from a plyometric standpoint, um, for example, I always like to start on really low level, easy exercises, and not just in plyometrics, but in, even in the gym and in movement. Um, you know, it's like I said, the video games are starts really easy. So all the movements in the gym and plyometrics movement are really simple, really easy. So from plyometric standpoint, uh, it's a lot of uh, uh, non-counter movement. Uh, box, simple six inch box jumps to kind of eliminate gravity so that he's not landing so, uh, so forcefully on the ground. So really kind of getting him to understand to just control the landing from like a base position with two legs. And if he feels good, move him to one leg, but just keep him again at really low level exercises. And then from a movement side, um, just uh, just right, trying to re, uh, re-pattern him. Um, and put him in good positions where he can own the positions and uh, and just build good coordination. And uh, and for me, really early on, it's uh, these drills are really good because they serve as kind of a screen for me. Um, a lot of times, players sometimes they 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 feel that pinch feeling in the back of the leg uh, in the injury, and they'll say, "Yeah, it's hurt." But then once that pain goes away, that pinch feeling goes away, they sort of feel like they're ready to go. And so when you're doing these really easy exercises and you have them doing like an ACF or a march and they don't, and they feel, they don't, does not feel good to them? They kind of know, okay, yeah, you're right. Like I'm not that, I'm not as good as I thought I was. And so I always say like, yeah, that's why we're gonna start with the easy stuff and get you to own it and, and build really good movement efficiency so that you don't develop any bad habits. Uh, so, you know, let's, let's stick with the plan, let's finish it and then we'll progress you as we go. Um, and this is what he did that day. Um, outside, you know, like I said, I move in order. So one thing at a time, I don't like to combine them together. So I don't like to do like a jump straight into a hurdle, straight into a run. Like you know, I like to focus on one thing at a time. So uh, this day, he uh, all he had to do to pass this stage was just complete two, la- uh, two sets of 10 minute runs around the field. And at this point, uh, one thing I'll say is I don't like to run with my athletes during any of these drills or any of rehabs because I like to watch them and see how they look. Um, it's hard to do that when you're running next to them. So I like to sit back and kind of watch, go talk with my physio and, 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 and see what he thinks and get an idea of, of uh, you know, where do you think he's at? So that's all he did this day. Um, and then in the gym, again, really simple, um, two isometric holds, one upper push, one upper pull, one lower pull, one lower push, two cores, couple isolated, uh, ex- muscle exercises, kind of covering all their bases from the movement side of the gym. And then uh, this is what he got out of that day. Uh, and in red, that was the goal, is just to hit that, that marker in the, uh, in, the, uh, met- in the GPS side. So just 4,600 meters for us, good day, we move on. Uh, stage three, uh, we wanted to get more and we wanted to work on that, uh, that high-speed running zone of 19 to 25 kilometers an hour. Um, and the goal that day was to complete the Kino runs that you see on the right hand side, two sets of two to three sets of three to four minutes, depending on the, on the case in this, in this situation, we did two sets of three minutes. Um, and as you can see from the plyometrics and the movement side, they start getting a little bit more, uh, 
more difficult, more complex. So, um, but from the uh, ball work side, we incorporated the ball a little bit just because every player likes the ball and the rehab, they, they want they want to touch the ball. So we just had the very simple, uh, you know, drills like just the ball in my hand, I just toss it to him and he takes it right back to me. Simple five yard pass receiving, you know, nothing too crazy, but um, the real test was the Kino runs. And it's really simple what I do here. I don't know if you guys can see my arrow here, but I just have them start right here at the edge of the 18. And I just have them uh, build into this run all the way to the other side. And then they recover. And I always have them start at like 70%. And then at the same time, I have the GPS going. So, uh, and it's live. So I can see what speed they're running at. And I always try to get them to start at like 19 kilometers an hour as a start and as they're doing it, I kind of have that conversation with them saying like, hey, do you feel okay? And in this case, he felt fine. So I just kept saying, all right, let's keep going. Give me a little bit more. So, you know, uh, inside that inside that box is where he's doing all the work. And then he recovers, comes back around, opens up, recovers, comes back around, opens up, um, takes a little break and then does it again. And then by the end of it, um, this is what he did that day. This is what we got out of him. And uh, for us, that was a, a big day. It was a good day for us um, because when you think about our sessions, typically we hit about uh, 500 meters of high speed running, 19 to 25, like on a Tuesday and Wednesday on a four day lead up to the game. So um, for us, we felt, okay, this was good. And then from his max velocity, uh, we got him to increase his speed. So um, uh, I told him that day, hey, you passed, like you felt good. Let's go back, let's go in the gym and continue to build the, the strength in that hamstring and, and just your overall body. You know, once we got into stage four, um, I wanted to get away from uh, just all the linear running that we were doing um, and also and work on something else. So again, kind of in my return to play, I tried to kind of work on one thing at a time. So uh, I, want, I, I always think of it as like, I want to, something give it a break and work on something else the next day so here it was uh, all about changing directions uh, and uh, the way I structured a session that day was that I wanted to work on the movement mechanics so push the base cross over the base resisted push the base resisted cross over the base and then from there go into the stage test where you can see on the right hand side these are the three exercises that I do they're controlled uh, drills where Number one, he just shuffles, breaks, stops, accelerates, decelerates, shuffles to the left, accelerates forward, shuffles back to the right. And again, uh, just having that conversation with him in that moment, you know, do you feel good? Yes, he feels good, good, you look good to me, let's move on. So we move on to the next one um, and knock out a couple of reps as well there where he just shuffles. And again, a little bit more difficult. So instead of having him pause here, you could have him, uh, you know, just go through it continuously. Um, I remember here, I started with having him do a pause. And then as he felt better, just having him eliminate the pause after the shuffle. So he went from shuffle, straight across, shuffle, straight across, shuffle, and then come back, recover, and then knock out the other side. And then, you know, give him a, a quick little break, have another conversation with him, asking him how he's doing. Uh, in this moment, he was in good, so we just kept going. And now, number three, we really started to get him going continuously and uh, and getting him to move a little bit faster at the same time. Um, and then after that, we uh, we went right into our position drills. Um, and then one thing I wanted to mention here about these position drills is that the videos that you're about to see right now, this, this, these videos aren't of the player doing the work. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a, uh, somebody from France come visit us, and I'm a huge fan of Marcelo Bielta, and he happened to have a video, tons of video on him and his exercises that he does, and he gave them to us. And when I looked at them, I was thinking to myself, man, these are perfect for return to play because the way he coaches his sessions is he breaks everything down to specific movements in the game and just has guys doing repetition after repetition so that it becomes kind of second nature of them in the game. And I thought, man, these are amazing. So. I kind of took them and, and implemented them in the return to play. And that day, these are the, 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 the drills he did that day. With, and, um, you know, for me, being a former player, uh, it's beneficial because I can do these drills with them. Uh, I, I, still, I, I think I still have the touch. So, uh, I have, so I can kind of play these balls into them. So the first one was just finding gaps that you'll see here. Um, play. So he's a nine. 
and a forward. So kind of getting him to find gaps in between the midfield and the defense, he receives, turns, right? Very simple, plays it back. And here you can change it up. You can play him a ball in the air. You can, you know, you can hit a really soft pass into him to start, or you can kind of hit an ink slinger pass. So it's just, you can do whatever you want with that. Uh, the next one was him as a winger driving in and I was acting kind of as an outside back, making an overlap pass. And then I would then become the dribbler kind of cutting inside as a winger and he would become the overlapping outside back and then uh, repeat again. So uh, we did these a couple times, again, just to kind of cap, uh, finish off what we had worked on in the movement skills and the control drills. And then when we looked at the GPS data, this is what we got out of him that day. And uh, for us, again, another good day because uh, we got a little bit more volume and high speed running, but then at the more importantly, we got about 28 explosive efforts that day, uh, which you know, is what we kind of see like on a medium day in training. Um, so again, I think what you're starting to see now is that he's starting to build some volume and some tolerance. And, and then that's really the goal during this rehab process is just to kind of create tolerance to the work that he's gonna see in training. Um, and his max velocity didn't go up, but again, that, that wasn't the goal that day. The goal that day was to try to get his, uh, his explosive efforts up and give his hamstring a little break so that we can, we can work on it uh, in stage uh, in the next day, which you know is still stage four, which you see here. So um, I put quote unquote sprinting because he's not really sprinting. He's, he's just kind of getting into that zone that, that the GPS tells us we consider to be sprinting. Um, so uh, we wanted to also inc uh, progress them along in the continuum and from the gym side, the plyometric side and the movement. Um, and that day, uh, this is what it looked like for him. So this is Thursday, day eight. Um, this is the day before his day off. So it's really a big day for him. I remember telling him, hey, look, this is a huge day because we're kind of finally getting into that zone where you could potentially pull your hamstring again because I'm gonna have you run a little bit faster. So, um, uh, again, during the rehab, just constantly talking to him and reminding him of what's coming up so that he can mentally prepare himself, I think is huge. So um, that's what I did with him and, and, and that's what that day looked like. So the, the running drill on the side that you see, that's what he had to complete at the end. And it's really simple. It's just box, box runs. But again, what I did was have him start really slowly. So about, I just, I measured the distance. It was about 70 meters from box to box. And uh, I, the way I do it is 70 meters divided by seven meters per second. And that kind of gives you kind of how fast he should get to the other side. And, and again, I have the live GPS. So at that moment, I remember uh, saying like, hey, you're hitting 25 right now. How do you feel? And he was telling me, I felt good. Like, I feel good. I can keep going. So I said, okay, let's ramp it up a little bit. So the way I have him do it is, again, it's a slow buildup. If you can follow the curve here on the, on the computer, is it's a slow build up here. And once he gets about 20 meters into it, I have him then pick up and try to hit that top speed zone and then really start slowing it down. And then once he gets to the end, he can recover and take as long as he can. Um, I don't really focus too much on you know what his heart rate looks like or is he getting uh, you know some anaerobic aerobic work done? Because for me, it's 14 days. He's not gonna lose that much fitness. Um, for me, it's more just, you know, can he move well, uh, movement efficiency, can he run without pain, and can he run and feel comfortable at the speeds that we need him to. So um, that's what we did that day. Um, and then when we looked at the, uh, the GPS uh, in the gym, uh, when we got back, we realized that, uh, 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 that it was a really good day for, for um, the, from the circuit because we got him into about 307 meters of, of sprint distance over 25 kilometers an hour. And that's roughly about what he would do in a game uh, on a good day if he's involved in the game a lot. If he's not involved in the game, usually they'll only hit about you know 150 meters of sprint distance over 25 kilometers an hour. And then we got more volume in on the high speed running between 19 and 25. So again, it's just that idea of just building volume, uh, building tolerance to the running and the lows that he's going to need when he comes back into training. And then the most important one here was that in that rehab, his max velocity that he hit was 29. So at that point, he's feeling good. I'm feeling good. Everybody's feeling good. The coach is starting to ask me, hey, how's he doing? And I'm telling the coach, hey, he's looking good, man. At this point, he's he'll be ready next week. Um, so uh, I think it's really important to consider 
kind of the uh, the conversations you're having with the coach. I remember having the conversation with the coach, telling kind of telling him like, "Hey, next week on Monday, we'll be ready to go." So if there's any way that you can create the the that first practice where we can get him involved as a neutral, it'll be huge because we'll be able to put him in that. And uh, and uh, unfortunately, he did. But before that, um, on Friday, day nine, we gave him a day off. We had a home game that day, so at the same time, personally, I needed a break from him a little bit as well. Um, and you also give him a break so that he can just go to the game and enjoy uh, supporting his teammates. Day five, the next day, we just took him in the gym and really worked on something different, kind of get him away from the field a little bit. So we really uh, stayed inside and worked on some speed strength, and close to strength, some hip ankle mobility. And then I used the woodway curve strides just to uh, just to keep him uh, active and from the from the sense of uh, just that idea of like. Uh, constantly exposing him to uh, that high speed running and sprinting. So, um, and at the same time that day, I kind of wanted to keep him going because I knew that he was going to get a day off Sunday, but Monday I was going to have him do his, uh, his last stages of, of return to play, which would be the, uh, the sprint test. So stage five, this is what it looked like from there. And then really stage six and seven, uh, kind of put them together. And uh, my physio and I that I worked with last year, uh, we, called, we called it a bridge plan because it kind of goes from that rehab straight into the, uh, the, the training. So that, so that bridge, that vision of the bridge kind of crossing over into the training. Um, the, the, the test for him at this point is really to, uh, uh, to complete the, the team warm up, the passing drills, the neutral and possession games. Um, any position drills that he's going to do with me, with I mean, the team. and then really just complete the full session. So uh, this is what it looked like for him that day. So now he's with the team. He's warming up with the team. Uh, he's completing the warm up, and that day uh, the warm up was really catered for him. So uh, the the team warm up was trying to get all the plyometrics in. At this point, we're really kind of working kind of towards that more intense uh, part of the. Uh, plyometric continuum so a lot of elasticity depth jumps continuous jumps um, and then from there went right into a, a team passing drill with a passing pattern um, after that I pulled him off to the side so while the team was uh, with the coach kind of getting ready for this 5v5 plus one small sided games I had set up this uh, this drill on what you see on the side on the on the on this field and the way I coach it is I tell the guy hey look this is what it's going to look like you're going to build up from here at the bottom in the dash mark. Once you kind of, once you hit this red portion right here, I want you to sprint in, in this spot in between here. So sprint here. And then once you get to the very end, which I put poles down, I always put poles down as the marker so that he can see where he has to sprint to. And then I had just, I tell him to, and then from now I want you to slowly decelerate. I don't want you to suddenly stop because you could possibly pull it. Um, so again, he builds up once he hits that once he gets to that first pole he hits it as hard as he can and then he slowly decelerates and then at the same time i'm looking at the gps live feed and i and i look at it and say like did he hit did he hit his top speed and a lot of times and i remember in this case the player said like what was my speed what was my speed and i, I think i remember it was like oh you hit 31 and he goes okay i, I felt good i was like yeah you feel good i'm like yeah cool i was like all right well i need you to do one more let's try to hit 33 because 33 is your top speed like that's what you usually do like that's the fastest i've seen you run um that you, since that since you've been here because he signed like a month ago with us um so that's what i knew to be true about him um and then after once he once he did that second one he hit 33 and after that you know we we're thanking god at that point we we're like poof because usually that's that for me that's the scariest part of the whole rehab is when you're having to when you're having him having to spend a hundred percent um, but you, again, you just kind of trust that all the work you did before that really prepared him for that. Um, and then after that, he went to the 5v1, played as a neutral. And then uh, we, he and I went off to the side after practice and again, worked on just more position drills to kind of, so that I can kind of use my eye to see how does he look. You know, obviously in training, I was watching him the whole time. And, but um, as a neutral, a lot of times you don't really get opportunities to finish. So. I wanted to pull him off to the side and work on his finishing. And so again, I went into my Bielsa library and uh, saw like, what, what do we, what do I got that I can use with him? And uh, this is what I pulled out of it. And this is what we did in training. But again, this isn't him, but this is, this is uh, very similar to what we did outside that day. So um, very simple. 
first post run, I would play a ball into him. First time finish, he recovers. Next one is a back post run. So cut, turn, back post, ball to the back. Okay. And then the next one, again, he plays as a winger for us in our 4 3 3 on the right side. So a lot of times in our games, we always kind of ask our players, you know, can you make a, a run in behind our defense? And can you find the ball in behind our defense rather than just always getting it and running at the defense? So um, this, this is kind of what that drill looked like. So ball over the top, receives it, finishes it, recovers. So again, all about just one action, not, not, three or four, it's, you know, I don't like drills where you have to do a ladder, jump over hurdles, sprint a couple poles, get a ball, dribble, dribble. For me, they're not very realistic to me. They don't really want to do that in the game. That's, uh, that's why I love these exercises because they're, they're very specific. Uh, and this is what he did that day. Again, the goal was for him to, to complete training, which he did, but most importantly, he hit his max velocity. Um, so it was a very, uh, light day in terms of volume from uh, the distance and the high speed running and the sprint distance but in training he got a lot of explosive efforts in that 5v5 game got about 44 and then hit 33 and then when you look at it from a current total at the very bottom you'll see well he hit his goal that we set for him he's right in that range from 20 to 25 thousand from the distance he's right in the middle of high speed running between 19 and 25 and he's and he's well over the 350 mark of sprinting over 25 kilometers an hour and then like he's just short of explosive efforts but at that point we felt super comfortable he felt really good and we thought hey look you're you're you pretty much passed so now you can complete training but now you have to complete the other side of the rehab which is you have to actually complete training um because uh, uh the way we do it is look if you're out one or two weeks you have to complete one week of training and what and that means you usually want to get two hard sessions in one medium session in and one light session in before you can complete uh, the entire rehab. And I think that's really important because it also provides an opportunity for the coach to see him in training where he's not limited and he can then make a decision whether or not it's best to, to, to start him or play him off the bench. And so um, I remember at this point, I, I kind of told the coach like, hey, look, he's good to go. My suggestion is that he plays off the bench, but I understand that at that moment in time, we were pushing for a playoff position. So we needed him to play because he was contributing a lot to us. And so, um, you know, we, the coach said, all right, let's look at him and let's see, watch him in training. And then we'll, uh, and then we'll make a decision at the end, like kind of as we go closer to the game and see what we're going to do with them. So at that point, you know, you kind of pick and choose your battles and you, uh, at the same time, you kind of trust your rehab and hope that, um, that it worked out well, but more importantly that the, that the coach can um, not play him full 90 right away. But again, that day um, he completed training. And then after that, we went inside the gym and did his Nord, Nordboard hamstring curl. And we always wanted him to be uh, right within 15% of where he was last time. Um, I don't remember the data of what he did that day, but um, again, uh, it's at this point, I felt pretty good. And the Nord, Nordic hamstring at that point was, was really just for a little bit of peace of mind. And, and also just to kind of give him more of a, uh, the eccentric loading to kind of solidify that, that muscle. Um, kind of at that point in the week in terms of periodization and what we would typically do with uh, with our team lifts. You know, on the first two day back, that's usually when we do our lifts and our heavy heat centrics. And then as we get close to the game, we kind of taper off. So um, that was that. Um, and then at the end of training, again, uh, my last eye test was really the shooting drill. So again, very simple, realistic things that he does in the game. This guy loves to dribble. He's a dribbler and he can shoot. So a simple drill, like just cutting in and shooting just to, uh, uh, really get him to do some high forceful movements. Um, and, and one thing I wanted to just say too, is that I count reps here. So it's five, like five to 10 shots, kind of like they do in baseball from what I understand is that they count pitches because it's such a high forceful movement and there's so much that goes into it. Um, so, and then I believe it's the same thing with shooting. So, um, I counted his reps here and then this was, uh, the last one, very simple drill, just straight down the middle shoot that was it
Yeah. And that's what he did in training that day. So I think when you look at it from uh, from the game aspect, like what, what does he do in a game? That's kind of what he typically would do. Maybe, uh, I don't know, I'd say a half, more than a half um, from a distance. Well, well more than what he would do uh, in a game with 614 and about 109 meters of sprinting over 25 kilometers. That's typically what he may be doing maybe after one half if he's having a good game in the game and he's really involved in the game. And then uh, he hit 31 cl uh, uh, kilometers an hour on his max velocity. Um, and then when you look at the grand total, he's well over and he's starting to really build some, some volume and some tolerance. And then this was just the rest of the week. Um, we gave him a day off Wednesday. The team trained, but we gave him a day off just so that he can recover from so much work they've done. And, uh, and then we continued with the rest of the week with Thursday, Friday. And then ultimately, when it came down to the decision of having him play, the coach played him, started him, and he went 80 minutes with us and fortunately he didn't get hurt and he had a good game and uh and we won um again it doesn't always work out the way you want but at this point you know um you just have to trust your work and trust your system and uh and i do so it, it ended up working out well this was the data of what he did that game he played 80 minutes and uh got about 8300 8400 meters of distance running about 176 meters of high speed running 131 meters of sprinting 40 explosive efforts and his max velocity that day was about 32. So um, he, the story after that was, um, I think we had about six, seven games left and uh, he can he played every game after that um, and didn't have any issues the rest of the season. Um, which was something that we were pretty proud of. Um, this return to play that you guys just saw, we do it with every injury. Uh, it doesn't change. Uh, it only changes in the gym, um, but from like the, the general uh, running drills and the plyometrics and the movement skills that we do in the position drills, they're all, it's all the same. So whether it's a quad injury, a calf strain, uh, uh, um, you know, a meniscus tear that we've done it with, it's, it's, it's the same really. Um, we've done it so many times now that we feel really comfortable with, with how we work it. Um, and some take home messages, you know, pro work with progressions or regressions, um, push them to the edge a little bit, and then work a step back from it. Um, always give the player a heads up of what's going on and what's coming up. And then uh, one of the most important ones is the athlete's intent, their attitude and their work rate will ultimately determine how successful the rehab is. If the guy's willing to work, he's got a good attitude and he's trusting you and he's not very afraid, typically they'll come back. Whereas if not, kind of tend to see guys take a little bit longer because they're just so hesitant to move and, uh, and, and, and get past these tough barriers that in their mind are, are, I can understand are really hard to get through. And then the last one is just get to know your player. More importantly, just building a good relationship with him. It's your time to kind of connect with them then. Um, like I said, for me, knowing the history of the sport, it's usually my time to kind of relate to them, story tell them, tell them times of, of when I was hurt or when you know, I read about certain players coming back from injuries and in time for World Cups, kind of those sort of stories I think are really important to, 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 to tell when you're rehabbing a player is just, um, just the, 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 the idea of storytelling um, and give, painting a picture for them. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for the time. Um, my Twitter down there is uh, at Johnny Alcaraz. I usually don't tweet anything for myself. I really just tweet things that I can consider interesting, but. And there's my email down at the bottom and I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have.